starting with our uh, first keynote speaker. It will be Liza Ushoa. Liza is a Brazilian living in Germany, in Munich, and uh, she is very active in the community. Uh, she's supporting many different conferences like Pi Pizza, speaking on uh, many events. She was a keynote speaker on the Open Search conference in Seattle. And let's start. Let's hear from Liza about the navigating open databases. So give a warm welcome to our speaker. Perfect. So hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about navigating open databases. So let's start. A little bit about me. Uh, I work for Ivan House Day Developer Advocate. Uh, at Ivan we manage open sources databases for developers. And I'm very active in the Python community. I really like the Python language. Uh, I live in the city of Munich and I organize PyLadies Munich Hi, ladies, Munich there. So in case you visit Munich ever, you can always contact me about the events that are happening there. And yeah, let's start. So for the agenda for today, uh, I first I, de I designed this talk to talk about Python and database, but now has become only database, so forgive me. Let's see what is in the agenda. So I started with the history of databases. Then I will go over some of the paradigmas uh, and I will give you my final thoughts. The slides can be found here with this QR code. I will show you in the end of the talk as well. I guess we need to change the microphone because this ran out of battery. Too many people talk today. <laughs> but is it working? I guess yes, everybody can hear me. So databases are where we store data in an organized way. Directly or indirectly, we are all using databases. But to understand how databases are right now, we have to step back and see why they were created or how they are, why they are how, how they are. So this goes back in the 60s uh, when the scientist called Charles Bachmann he designed the first computerized database. Right after he, there was IBM who designed their own first database as well. Those databases, they were, uh, they were named or titled as navigation of database management systems. So what, what, that, what not navigation database uh, means? It means that you would have to go through the whole database or to navigate through the whole database to find what information you are looking for. As you can think about, this doesn't seem like the best approach, but this was how it was back then. In the middle, so there was a time the people uh, start to create things, but there is also a time when people start to use those things. And this happened in the middle of the 60s. So they start to use more and more those databases. And every time people start to use something, there is a need to have a standardized way of developing something. So that's what happens with the databases. Uh, the customers ask, we need a, a standardized way. And Charles Bachmann uh, went again with a group of people called the database task group, and he created a sort of approach, and it's known as the CODASIL approach. So what was the CODASIL approach? Uh, pretty much you can think of something like this. It was like uh, uh, you would navigate through linked data sets until you find the information. It was not easy, it was quite confusing, because it uh, requires a lot of training from the people who are using this database, and also for the people who want to develop such a database. Uh, in the end, it was, yeah, you will have to go frog and frog and frog. So this database didn't become as popular as they could have been. 
In the 70s, someone called Edgar Cord, who worked at IBM, thought, okay, those databases, those navigation databases are not great because they cannot do search. We need to think about a way of having data that are searchable. And he, he wrote uh, some scientific paper, design, how to design relational databases. He did this based on relational calculus. So there was a lot of mathematics behind it. In the CODASIL approach, as I explained, it was a bit like a linked list. It would go from one data to another data to another data, but it becomes a bit more complicated in the end. With the new approach that Edgar Code has proposed, the data would be organized in tables. And uh, these tables, they would have fixed length of the records, and each table would represent an entity. Also, there will be attributes, which would be uh, saying the characteristics of those instances entities. One thing that was also described in this paper is that the table should have primary keys, which are a, a unique identifier for each row in this table. From those primary keys, you could now do cross-reference, and you, wouldn't, you would now just uh, reference to the next primary key and so on, rather than having the disk addresses. You could do joins. Uh, there were also some mathematical operations that were available with this uh, new approach. And this was basic based in the system of relational calculus. This is what we know as the relational databases. Another thing that was there was also the views. So whatever table was, how, how they were, they will, could be presented to the people in a different ways. Even though you could have not update it, you could still have these views of different tables. This is was what theory is. In practice, uh, one of the first databases that were relational is the so-called ingress database. And it started back in the University of Berkeley uh, with two scientists called Wong and the Stonebreaker. So they went together, they read this paper, and they say, okay, let's try out and make this database. And uh, they named it as Ingress. And this database had a red query language, known as the Quell language. The Quell language is similar to SQL. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, but what the Quell language had was more true to the mathematical uh, way that Edgar called described. You may be thinking why the uh, Quell language didn't become so popular? Why we use SQL nowadays? So SQL was easy to parse and it was less scary because uh, with the Quell language you would have to really f uh, follow the mathematical approach and if you didn't have this mathematical background it started to become harder. So SQL was more uh, approachable. But they are pretty similar in the syntax. One of the scientists, uh, Stonebreaker, he left the university and he said, okay, maybe I will do my own database, uh, business related. Uh, but then he went back and to the university again and he said, okay, actually uh, what I want to work is in a post-grass database, a post-ingress database. So it still is the one that we know nowadays. <laughs> Uh, one thing that Postgres was trying to fix for the ingress database was the data types. So there were problems uh, defining the data types, and this was, although people were using, they had to define themselves. And Stonebreaker thought, okay, we need to define, we need to do, design a database that actually can handle data types and can handle relationships better. So he created Postgres, post ingress. You may be thinking some people are like, uh, is it called Postgres or Postgres SQL? I don't know, do you think it's Postgres? Uh, raise your hands. Only one person. <laughs> uh, if you think it's Postgres SQL, uh, raise your hands. <laughs> Most of people have no opinion, which is very smart in this world. <laughs> But the right one is both. Uh, it start has Postgres, uh, and later on, uh, when they added compatibility with SQL, uh, they become Postgres SQL. But because a lot of documentation and a lot of people still use Postgres, they say, 
okay, let's keep it both names. So the official name is Postgres SQL, but the alias is Postgres. So you can see it here. So you can say that in the 80s, uh, it's where people start to use in those relational databases. So the sun was shining for this type of databases. The industry was starting to use and was moving in this direction. But in the 90s, I don't know, do you know what happened in the 90s? The wild world, the internet was created. <laughs> A lot of companies uh, start to uh, have their services more well-related, and people were programming with object-oriented programming languages, such as Java, C Sharp, C++, and so on. So when people start to deal with data, the data was in tables, in these relational ways. And then they start to get this data into the programs, which was OOP-related. So it, they start to think, okay, wouldn't make sense that the data wouldn't be in this relational ways, but has an object. So I can easily manipulate in the programming. Yes, this would make sense. So a lot of people enthusiastic uh, thought about a new way of design databases. Is the known has object databases. But as I said before, the companies, they were already moving in the direction for relational databases. So if your company was at the time here and want to use uh, object database because it was exciting, uh, it would be not so easy because you would have the trouble of making your, whatever you have has relational, now being treated as objects. Uh, and this is a known problem called impedance, let's say, impedance mismatch, object, object relational impedance mismatch. How to translate what was in relational databases to now objects. It, you can imagine it wasn't an easy task. I'm not saying it was impossible, it was just costly. And as we know, the market is about costs and efficiency. So they let it as it is, they continue using relational databases. And object databases, uh, okay, they still progress, but at the time, uh, they didn't become the best idea. So we are back in the 2000s, and now other companies and other people, and they start, started to work in different databases. There were new players in the market, such as Cassandra, Dynamit, Dynamit Voldemort, and many authors. Uh, so one person called Johan Oskarasson realized that, wow, now we, don't, we have so many databases that are no relational. And he thought, it's time that we all meet together and we can exchange information about how the, the, those databases work. So he thought, okay, for this meetup, uh, it was really a meetup kind of way, he said, we need some sort of hashtag or some sort of name for all these different databases in the market. And they come up with a name called NoSQL, which is, uh, yeah, it turns out like this. But what those databases had in common? They had in common that they, were, they didn't use the schemas, uh, they were more thought in a distributed way, different of relational databases that were more monolithic, and there were no relational. Yes, yeah, so the name became NoSQL. So if there was no paper or scientific thing, or why is it NoSQL? As NoSQL was used before, but it became a trend here, has a intention to have a hashtag for this meetup. What uh, NoSQL means, there is a lot of uh, theories about what it means, but really we could only ask the author. Uh, but the, some people say it's like no SQL because those databases don't use SQL, or they use SQL but not only SQL. Uh, you can pick any of you. <laughs> I'm sure someone would discord. So these are a little bit about the history of databases. And you can even find here in his uh, blog where, how the meetup went. This is about the history of databases, but what, which databases people love, uh, which databases developers are using right now. 
I pick up from the Stack Overflow survey some of this uh, data uh, from 2021 to 2022. Of course, there are more databases, but some of the favorites are relational databases. Postgres SQL is in the top, uh, followed by MySQL, uh, MongoDB is a document database, and authors here. We have also, we can also see that most databases from one year to another year, they have more people who adapted from there to there. Uh, one exception here would be Elasticsearch has a chain of license that maybe could explain why less people have used it. Now that we saw some of the databases, uh, I will go over some of the paradigmas of databases. The first one is the key value. If you're a Python developer and you have used dictionaries, which probably you did it, uh, key value databases are a bit like Python dictionaries. You have a key and you have a value. It's simple as that. But the cool thing about this database is that uh, one example of this database is Redis database. Uh, the nice thing is that they are really fast. And you may wonder why. So in Redis, the data is saved in memory. This, uh, you don't need this way around trip to the disk uh, to pick up data there and come back. No, it's in memory and it's, it's fast as it is. This has some downsides because you cannot save so much data there, right? And uh, I wouldn't say that you should use Redis as your main database. But it's pretty fast. We choose a cases uh, key value databases uh, are appropriate, are for caching, for, for example, Redis has public and subscribe functions, or for leaderboards. This is how key value. Key value is, as you can think about, uh, yeah, it's pretty limited. It's good in what it does, but sometimes you have more complex databases. And uh, one of them is uh, wild column. So in this database, it's kind of you took a value uh, from the database and from the key value database and you add a second dimension to it. So there is a key space which holds one or more column family, as you can see it here, and each column family holds a set of order uh, rows. As an example of those databases is Cassandra. So Cassandra has something interesting. Uh, there is a query language called S uh, CQL, which is, I believe, Cassandra query language. Uh, this is a query language that is similar to SQL, but not quite the same. But it's, the, I think the goal of having such a language uh, for querying that is similar to SQL is that if you are expert in SQL and you are moving to a new database, which is, could be Cassandra, you can use CQL. But if you have your scripts there uh, and you have join things and stuff like this, won't work. Because Cassandra is a kind of database that does not support join. One thing Cassandra is, it is schemaless. Every time people say schemaless, you think, okay, you don't need to worry about schemas. But actually, it's not true. Even databases that are schemaless uh, just means that you don't, you don't need to think about the schemas there, but you always have to think about the schemas from your side. When you query things, if they are not there, that could be a problem. So it is schemaless, but uh, yeah. Cassandra, as I say, there is no joins. If you like joins, uh, then <laughs> find another database. <laughs> and uh, one cool thing is that it's very scalable. It's easy to scale uh, in across the nodes in this kind of, like to share the data. The way that it's, uh, the data is saved, because it's saved by the column, like the data is stored by columns, you can easily aggregate things with Cassandra for example, with white columns database. But if you want to save more complex data, this is, there is always a database for this, uh, for this thing. And one of them is the document database. So document databases, they are quite interesting. Uh, they are collections that can be organized in, yeah, it's kind of you have documents, and these documents, you can form collections out of this, and those collections can be organized in a hierarchical way. They also allow that you go through relations between them, 
uh, they also don't support Joy. One thing, when you are using document databases, uh, you kind of have to think, okay, maybe I can, you're encouraged to have big documents, a lot of data into one document. Because when you query this data, then everything is kind of there. It's um, very fast to read. It's faster to read than to write. Why is that? Because when you are reading, you will pick up the whole document and you can read, right? But when you want to write, and for example, you want just to modify one single line there in your document, this becomes costly. Some examples of document databases are DynamoDB, MongoDB, OpenSearch, and so on. So that's how the document databases work. Inside the document databases, and, but this becomes also another paradigm, are search uh, databases. So you can think about, okay, if you had a book, uh, you probably read some book before you had computers. So in the book, when you look for something there, uh, in the previous book, if you don't know this, then you're very young. But in the book, you, had some, you have an index, and in this index, you look for the words. The index will tell you which page you can find that subject. That's easy, as that is. So that's how you could look for it. The doc, uh, this document data, there are document databases, but in specialized in search. Uh, they work similar to what the book did. It. So when you send it in unstructured data, for example, text, uh, you know, we are surrounded by unstructured data. And you send your text to there, what it will do, it will save those documents uh, using inverted index. So when you query your data, so when you query a word there, their results will be ranked. So you will most likely find the most uh, relevant results. Those databases are, yeah, they do it this kind of magic. They are good for text, uh, they are optimized for text, uh, but for example, even if you are using them for your application, um, maybe it's costly because you have to query things there and so on and have this uh, set up there. But it's very good for your user because uh, in any application you want to search for things and it's good to have a specialized way to understand human text writing, for example. One, one example of this databases are open source database, which is a direct fork of Elasticsearch, but open source. Uh, and there's so many cool things uh, in this database. For example, when you are sending your data to there, you can specify which language you are sending, so it was, uh, it's optimized for language. You can also uh, implement auto-completion in your application, so when people are typing, the database kind of uh, finds where to go, and it has support for fuzzy searching, and is open source. These are some cool things about search uh, databases, such as open search. Now I'll go to the relational, but as I explained relational before, now maybe I would just say some curiosities now. So relational databases are in tables, as I explained, and you uh, organize your data there. Some, ex some examples of these relational databases are Postgres SQL. You may be thinking, why, post why we still use Postgres SQL? It's, it's really uh, quite old database. But one thing that Postgres uh, has it very well is that it has a lot of uh, plugins, it has a lot of ways that you can go from Postgres, you can go to other databases. And this is important, this is important in any technology. If you want to propose something to something that's already established there, you have to very, be very good in the transition. Otherwise, people will not adapt. Some other databases are MySQL and MariaDB. These are also top of the most used databases in Stack Overflow. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the same creator of MySQL also creates MariaDB. Actually, MySQL is a celebration of his first daughter's uh, her name is Mai. And uh, Maria DB is also a celebration of another daughter. Her name is Maria. So he even have a son with his name is Max. And guess what? It's also a database. Those relational databases, they have something very powerful. They, ha they are asked compliant. 
What does that mean? Uh, the A stands for atomicity, which means it's, uh, that is either the transaction will be successful or will not be successful. So it ensures that, yeah, the data will be saved. There is uh, consistency, uh, which ensures that the data is consistent across uh, the tables. There is iso isolation, which means that if you're doing transactions in different ways, they should not interfere with each other. And there is the durability, which means that once the transaction is committed, it will remain in the system, even if there's a system crash. So any of database that is asked compliant uh, will ensure that only successful transactions are processed. This is very important when, when you're dealing with money. So for banks and financial institutions, it's crucial that you have a database that you want to uh, make mistakes on this aspect. It's better to have the, the transaction cancel than to have a misleading transaction. Some other things about relational databases, they have schema. This can be a good thing, this can be a bad thing. It's really up to you. But when you have a schema, it's harder to update the table just spontaneously uh, because you always have to care about the schema. So if you want to change the type there, you have to update your schemas as well or even update your schemas first and then change whatever you want to change. So this can be maybe hard. The documentation is good. Uh, you see they had a lot of time to have good documentation. So compared to uh, maybe younger databases, they very well documented. If people already tried a lot of things, so you can find always someone who, who had experience uh, on those databases uh, and find your answers. They have a lot of plugins, so even if you want to start with a relational database and later on maybe you need a distributed system because it, it grows so much, they have plugins that you can just you know, send your data to a new database. They are very easy in this sense, they are very good on that. Uh, yeah, that's it about re relational database, but once you, when you talk about relational database, you think, well, they must be very good with relationships between data, but this is not true. For this kind of, if you want to know how the data is related to another data, there, is a, there are the graph, the graph databases. So the graph databases are basically, it, you, would, uh, you would treat the relationship itself as a data, and the data would be represented as node. So the relationship between them uh, are kind of edges. One example of this graph databases are Neo4G. If, if you want to compare how it was with relational databases uh, to how the graphic works, would be something a bit like this. Uh, if you want to see with a relational database, you would have to create another table or to have this kind of relationships you have to maintain. And it can be quite complicated. With graph database, you would just connect the dots, so to say. So they are quite useful if you want to see the big picture. I think they are interesting databases. That's, uh, I will give you some thoughts about what I explained. So first one is what you want is different w about of what you need. Even if you had your favorite databases and you really want to use that database in someone else's company, it's not exactly what you need. You should look really how your data is and what you need there and what you will need in the future because uh, things change and the data is always growing. If I say uh, there are plenty more fish in the sea and they really mean databases in the open sea, you can always find the databases for your wishes. There are so many uh, nowadays. A lot of those databases out there, they are, op they are open source. And uh, if you are using uh, the databases in your company and profiting from that, it would be really nice if you can support this project. Uh, that's it, I have the slides here, and you also can try out some of the databases with my company for 30 days. <laughs> so it's the code here if you want. So thank you very much.
Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, is there a way to achieve ACID in NoSQL databases? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Probably. They have so many ways to do things, but I think if you are a NoSQL database, you cannot have ACID compliance because even if you had the, is it what you really want? Because you need to distribute the data. So I'll, I would say no. Uh, could you compare these databases with Neon? Neo 4G or? That, that's a question to the author of this question. But I don't know Neon database, so I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to compare. But what kind of database is Neon? I saw one of them, but I didn't want to put it here. It was like multi dimension or the name was multi, <laughs> and it was a many concepts uh, of databases together. Probably is this one. Uh, is Transact SQL used anywhere? My only contact with it was it's 10 years ago during years. studies. If you, if you had contact 10 years ago, I also didn't have contact. <laughs> Sorry, but you, you would have to go in the university. But good, we are in the university. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I have a question of my own. Do you have any pro tips for people starting new projects? Uh, as which type of database to choose? You know, people offer, often think, uh, well, is my use case right for NoSQL, or maybe I should go straight away for a relational database? Yes, I would say that uh, for a lot of people, uh, Postgres SQL is still the database to go. Uh, but if, I would say if you don't care about losing data, uh, if you just if you have so much data like logs, for example, that you don't care if you lose one second of this data, you could use easily a NoSQL database, uh, for example, OpenSearch or Elasticsearch, they are a good fit for that. So it would depend, but I'll say also Postgres has a lot of plugins, so you can start with Postgres and move to another one, yeah. And Postgres, I guess, made this a little bit easier, this decision by introducing the JSON data type. Yes. So you see, they have so many <laughs> ways of uh, encharm you. Uh, I think Postgres is a really good option. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.